Hello, everybody. We're just giving it a few seconds for folks to get settled in before we kick off our awesome Building with Benefits webinar series. Thanks for joining us today. Wonderful, people trickling in. Awesome. Okay, everybody. Great. Let's go ahead and get it kicked off because we do have quite a packed agenda today. I'm so pleased to welcome you all here. I'm Allie Robbins. I am a contractor with uh, the US Department of Energy. I'm gonna be helping uh, facilitate this panel today, um, but I am certainly not the star. Um, our great folks that we have lined up for you are going to talk about some of their awesome projects and programs around equitable workforce development. So thanks so much for being here. A few quick housekeeping points. This session is being recorded. So just for everyone's awareness, also, the slides and the link to the recording will be made online after the event. So no worries if you miss something or you need to revisit some information provided on some slides, those will be put on our website. So fear not. And then also, I really encourage you all to please put questions for the panelists and moderators into the chat. You should be able to do that. We will have a Q&A section. So really looking forward to the awesome engagement that I know you all will provide. So we're going to do just some quick welcoming and introductions in the chat. Please feel free to share your name and organization and why you're joining this conversation today about equ equitable workforce development. And again, we're really excited, excited to highlight some folks that are deeply engaged in equitable community solar development. So if you're in the virtual room, please go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. Just a quick overview of the agenda. So again, I'm Allie Robbins with the US Department of Energy. We have a wonderful moderator today, Chris Nichols, um, who I'll turn it over after I do a little bit about um, NCSP and why we're all here today. And then I'll, she will hand it over to our awesome um, Sunny Awards winners who are going to highlight their projects and programs, particularly around work for equitable workforce development. And then we'll also have a panel discussion and Q&A. And then we'll do a quick closing at the end. So lots to look forward to. So again, I just want to talk um, a little bit, you know, about what the National Community Solar Partnership is, but I first want to talk about why the National Community Solar Partnership exists. So this slide right here is probably one of the most important statistics in support of community solar. A few years ago, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory did a study to get an idea of who had the ability to install a solar system on their roof and access all the benefits of generating your own electricity. What they found was that 49% of households and 48% of businesses cannot host a PV system of the right size on their own building. And what's important to know is that the factors they were considering when they were identifying those households were how much sunlight hits the roof, so what is the solar potential, how much space was on the roof to generate solar, and whether or not the roof was actually owned by the occupant of the building. What they did not take into account was whether or not the occupant had the financial resources to install their own system which means that these systems, these numbers might actually be a little bit lower if we were to take that into account. So community solar can really be seen as a solution here because it allows households and businesses to subscribe to and receive the benefits of a community solar array that is not on their own roof. But as the right side of this slide shows, there's still far less community solar than would be required to fill this gap. Right now, when we're looking at all the electricity in the United States, solar makes up less than 10% of all electricity generation. And that community solar is that tiny yellow sliver that you can barely see on this pie chart. 
It makes up about only 5% of, of solar generation. And a, a, very importantly, when you look at community so this, this pie chart about community solar, just 1% of community solar right now is dedicated to low and moderate income households. We know that the benefits provided by community solar are especially important for households that have higher energy burdens or have limited incomes. So this slide is really the motivation for the National Community Solar Partnership. We're working as a program to provide resources to support more equitable access to affordable community solar for all United States households. And we really hope to close this gap and make sure that the benefits of clean energy flow to everybody. So to talk about what the National Community Solar Partnership does, uh, for those of you that are joining your first NCSP event, welcome. We're really excited that you're here. The webinars that we're running this summer is a part of a broad set of resources. First, um, and this is the little blue part on the left of this slide, we publicly share data and analysis on the community solar market. So we look at projects and where they're located, but also other factors that impact community solar development, such as policies, best practices, and program design. And if you want even more resources, you can actually join the National Community Solar Partnership. So that's our orange collaboration part of our circle. Our online community platform can connect you to the over 1500 members of the NCSP. You'll also have access to our technical assistance program, which provides on-demand one-to-one assistance with our subject matter experts um, from national labs and third-party subject matter experts. So this is really an opportunity to support any local challenges that you all might be facing as you want to install community solar. And so we all know that when we set a goal, we have to create steps to make sure that we're addressing the challenges and barriers that are going to help us meet that goal. And that is where we created our pathway to success priorities. There are five major elements on this pathway, and they're designed to address what a group of stakeholders identified as the five key barriers to more equitable access to community solar. So those key barriers include having more resources um, to build technical expertise and capacity. Um, of course, we need engagement on many different levels, but particularly leadership from states. We need uh, greater access and more equitable access to the capital that we use to build and deploy projects. We also need some more tools for engaging with customers and acquiring community solar customers. And of course, education and outreach, where would we be without that? Um, community solar is, and we you know, help provide and explain what those benefits are. And all of these initiatives are building towards this target that we have to enable community solar to power the equivalent of 5 million households by 2025. So no, no big deal, just some pretty ambitious goals. <laughs> so to talk a little bit about um, why we're all here today and the impetus for these webinar series. So equitable workforce development is baked right into our targets. And you'll notice in that little green banner on the right-hand corner, um, it's a major priority for the Department of Energy's list of just as 40 priorities, um, which are about delivering benefits to all households. So as we're going to discuss a lot today, workforce development has significant implications for the communities and where these projects are located. When you think about how vast of a geography our country is and you look at you know, employment rates and the opportunities to provide new career paths and even ensuring a prevailing wage, this is a very hot topic across many different issues, but particularly community solar. So if you're curious about all these other benefits that are listed here, the good news is that today's webinar is just one in a series of six webinars. This is the fourth. Um, so we have done, we've covered quite a bit of ground already, um, but we're really excited to talk about innovation and community engagement coming up. So please stay tuned for a list of webinars at the end that you all can enjoy. And I won't bore you too much with this last slide because I know Chris is also going to talk a little bit about this. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to her in a second. 
But uh, these meaningful benefits are really a key component of the National Community Solar Partnership and the reason why our panelists are here. Um, NCSP launched the Sunny Awards for Equitable Community Solar to better recognize and amplify best practices of existing community solar projects and programs. We awarded 17 special recognition prizes um, that deliver each of these meaningful benefits and five grand prize winners. So we gave away almost $100,000 in cash last year. Um, this year, there's twice as much funding attached to this. So $200,000, um, which is eligible for um, folks to apply to until July 14th. Um, so as, as Chris is gonna go over today, Max, Juan, and Kevin are representative of some of these winning projects and their exemplary work about providing workforce development programs. Um, so if you or someone you know in your network is developing community solar with these meaningful benefits, we really encourage you to apply. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it over to our moderator, um, who is going to do an amazing job. If you have not met, met Chris Nichols, you are, you are in for a treat. <laughs> so she is going to take it away, and I will pass it over to her. Thank you all. Thank you, Ellie. I'm going to bring up my slides here. Let's see. Let's do this. Go back to the top. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. Looks good. All right. So here we are. Thank you all for joining today for this National Community Solar Partnership webinar, because this is, and I'll, I'll just say this because, you know, hey, it's the most meaningful webinar and the most meaningful activity you can engage in to rapidly and comprehensively lift the diversity and inclusion in the clean energy workspace. This industry, as we all know, has challenges with, um, with being a little too white, a little too male, a little too less, you know, a little not enough inclusive and representative of the full capacity and, and fabric of the United States. We want every community, every person with interest and willingness and capacity to be part of this career, part of this professional um, movement toward a clean energy economy right now in the moment, because this is when we have momentum and this is when we have a chance to actually change a system that has been too oppressive uh, to too many for too long. But we can do something about that. If you're on the call today, and especially if you're one of our panelists, you are taking action, you are part of the solution. And we all wanna become better at solving these very large challenges. So let's get to it. First, let's, let's just level set on what we mean by diversity, equity, inclusion, and access or belonging. And access and belonging are two different things. Diversity, obviously, representing many, many, a multitude of attributes, traits, characteristics, Equity and equality, very different. Equity means recognizing that we all didn't start from the same foundational place, but we all need the same chance at fairness and justice to reach our goals and aspirations. So equal opportunity through equity. Equality means just treating everybody the same no matter where you started from. If you started with a lot of advantages, whether or not you asked for those advantages, you're ahead of the game. Um, I think maybe we should remind the Supreme Court of this, uh, but moving right along, uh, inclusion is, is that quality that guarantees that when we are able to attract, recruit, and hire candidates that are different from the majority of the, the colleagues, that every candidate still feels like they have a special place and a value and belong to your organization. You have to culturally shift to exude and embody the traits of inclusiveness. And I think you'll hear from some of our panelists on how they've succeeded in, in that aspect of their operations through workforce training too. Accessibility, D-E-I-A, access, who gets in to our systems in our organizations and how do they get there? So we all, we all come to this place from different starting points. Access means 
you as an individual or as a group have the financial, cultural, physical, maybe emotional and structural systemic conditions that allow you to fairly and justly enter an opportunity, take advantage of an opportunity. And accessibility also recognizes we all bring different talents and capacities, but all these things can be valuable and contributive. Those who are differently able, those who are, you know, different, different races from ours, different ethnics. We are all neighbors and we, no matter what we're like, form a strong and vibrant community. Belonging is a little bit different. It means when I'm in a place, when I'm in a group, do I feel that I am safe, that I am recognized, that I'm seen, that my voice is heard and has some power and I can, I can express myself and feel heard and feel valuable in my tribe, in my group. That's the sense of belonging. Both accessibility and belonging have to be nurtured and built in most US institutions. And if you're not there, you gotta work on it. And people here will help you. Let's see, move on slide, move on slide. Okay, why are we focusing on equity in the workforce system? There's a lot of ways to be equitable in our clean energy and our solar, particularly our community solar practices, we have communities and there are lots of ways to interact with and be part of and walk with a community. Workforce is particularly powerful because we know there are lots and lots of new jobs that we need to be filled. We need people with passion and capacity to take those jobs. And they need to be at every level, not just the beginning, entry-level installer technician, uh, we need folks at certainly at that entry level to join this industry and build a profession and a career that will sustain themselves and their families. We need mid-career folk who are transitioning around and looking for a great opportunity. We need uh, professionals and colleagues from other institutions and industries that are perhaps becoming less prominent. The fossil fuel industry comes to mind, coal, gas, oil. These, these are industries that are starting to lose jobs, but the professions and the professionalism to drive those industries can be brought into solar, can be effectively brought into all the clean energy industries with just a little upskilling. And of course we need senior managers, vice presidents, uh, chief operating officers, financial officers, executives, all levels are needed. And we're talking about just in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act, if you look at the, the graphic, we need like mm, 540,000 or so new solar jobs by 2032. We need a similar number, well, not quite as many, maybe 400,000 some wind jobs. We need 200 some thousand energy storage, energy transmission jobs and so forth, which is why we need all these people when we're talking about equitable workforce, we offer opportunities for a fair and just opportunity to everyone. And then we build the inclusiveness and the belonging within our institutions to help them remain there and thrive. I've just repeated some of the most recent demographic um, findings from uh, the Solar Jobs Census to drive home the fact that we're not quite there yet in solar, this, does, this is not specific to community solar or community involvement, it's just the workforce for solar from the 2021 uh, survey reflected in the 2022 census. Really, we're behind in almost every category except perhaps Hispanic or Latino workers, but even that is not gender uh, equitable. So, we have a long way to go. I'm glad that we are enthusiastic and impassioned to take these steps to, to develop more equitable workforces. So now I wanna turn it over to some of the more expert practitioners um, going right now. We have three panelists, I'm very excited to hear from them. Max Levitsky from Solar One, Juan Para from Nexamp, and Kevin Dunshee from Solar Landscape. Each of these organizations won a Sunny Award in 2022, and they're gonna share what worked for them with you. Um, 
And, and that's what we want to know now, the secrets, the secret sauce. How did you do it? Uh, so each of our panelists is going to speak to the successes they've had in, in particular ways. Did they Were they able to recruit a very local, robust uh, workforce through strong community engagement? Did their workforce training speak to some value or some uh, property that, that helped succeed for those community solar projects and deliver equity? How did they how did they work forward and deliver all these things? So now let's go to our panel. Um, I also want to share that these slides will be available to you afterwards. The, all the links in all our slides are live, so you don't need to take frantic notes. You can listen, you can ask your questions. We will we have a big QA session at the end. And the links here are also live. So I, I will repeat Allie's admonition, please. Register for all the webinars, catch webinar five and six if you haven't registered for all of them already. Look toward the fall, maybe in September when the National Community Solar Partnership at DOE will release a building toward best practices guide, possibly September, possibly October. And if you still have a project and, and wanna do that, you've got till July 14th to get your Sunny Award application in for 2023. So, I'm going to stop sharing now. Stop my share. And Juan, if or, or I'm sorry, Max, you're first up. Could you start us off and present ideas uh, from Solar One? Yes, I can. Thank you, Chris. Just one second. All right. Um, so thank you, Chris, so much um, for the introduction and Ali at the top. I appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Max Levitsky. I'm a senior director at Solar One. We are a New York City based nonprofit with a broad focus on renewable energy and specifically helping folks from underserved communities across the city get access to the benefits of renewable energy and the clean energy economy. So, before I talk about our project and the work we've done, just a little background on the organization. Um, a lot of the work we do focuses on education in some capacity. So I oversee all of our workforce development initiatives, sometimes tied to projects like um, the one we were awarded the Sunny Award for, other times just in partnership with other organizations across New York City. But that is only um, a slice of what of the great work Solar One does. We also have our Green Design Lab, which is education initiatives for K through 12 students across New York City. They've been in hundreds of schools for the past 10 plus years and trained over or trained thousands of students um, ranging everything from introducing climate change to second graders all the way up to teaching high school CTE students how to do solar installations in their electrical programs. Um, we also have a very robust technical assistance program for solar called Here Comes Solar, which is aptly named. So that is the work that is really more on the product development side that was tied to the project I'm going to be talking about, which also connects to workforce. So when we have overlap like that at Solar One, um, it's really exciting. Um, we also manage a park on the east side of Manhattan, Sty Cove Park. There are a lot of education initiatives where for the uh, the community in the area and anyone who wants to come by, and clean energy connections also helping spread the um, you know organizing events like this for New York City based renewable energy. So. Quickly, um, the Green Workforce Program, we have really two main goals. Um, we want to provide training and opportunities for underserved populations across the city in some of these quickly growing fields, one of them being solar energy. And I would argue even more important than that is goal number two, which is our focus on transferable skills um, to help open up multiple different pathways for students once they complete their time at Solar One. So that covers things such as the construction industry or the building sector, um, you know, areas where people on this call are maybe more likely to think of them as, you know, clean energy or green sectors, but the lay audience would not immediately think, oh, that's a renewable energy job. And that's kind of getting to another main point where we like to think of how can we make all jobs green and not how can we train people for green jobs? Because part of how we're gonna meet all these aggressive climate goals is to broaden the definition of what a clean energy or green job is. Um, the vast majority of students that come to Solar One are from um, some sort of underserved community. So most of them are un under or unemployed 
They are typically from low to moderate income communities. And in the case of this program, they were NYCHA public housing residents who were then put through the solar uh, training program. Um, most have little to zero experience in the sector. And this is something that's completely new for them. And we take them through training programs that are on average a month long um, and geared toward that entry level sort of skill set. So um, since the Green Workforce Program has been in place, we've trained over 5,000 students, which is a stat we're very proud of. We took a little dip during the height of the pandemic, like so many other uh, businesses and organizations across the country, but we're actually on track this year to train the most students we ever have in a single year, which is really exciting. So this project in particular, Community Power, um, 1.2 megawatts project installed in three separate NYCHA campuses across the city, um, targeting, uh, serving over 500 low to moderate income NYCers, um, which are defined as at or below the 80% average medium income. Um, the team consisted of, one second, excuse me. Uh, the project team consisted of a variety of very talented other nonprofit organizations, CBOs, mission-driven financiers, um, an energy cooperative, the public housing entity itself, NYCHA, and obviously a solar installer and utility. Um, so the goal of this program was 100% low to moderate income subscribers for the community solar project, um, green workforce training for residents of the buildings that the project was installed on, um, paid job trainings for at least 15 of those residents, and a goal of 20% bill discount savings for subscribers. Um, so part of what makes this project interesting as well, um, the workforce training is required for anyone who wanted to apply for this solicitation. So if you had any interest as a developer in trying to be awarded some of this work, you had to have a workforce training program in place. And that's really something that um, I want to come back to later and that I want everyone to keep in mind is that sort of shift is what's really going to help push us more in this equitable direction of making sure that opportunities are equal, excuse me, equitably distributed, um, especially to the communities where the projects are taking place. So some photos of the project um, and a little more info. Uh, 25 NYCHA residents were trained. 12 were hired for the project itself, and five received full-time job opportunities after the project was completed um, at other solar companies. Uh, the training was paid via funding from Con Edison, which is the New York City utility. Um, it's their RAB demonstration project. And the training itself was two weeks long, um, led by Solar One and the amazing instructors that I'm honored to work with almost every single day. Um, they covered a green construction course, which had topics that included carpentry and electrical work. So really simple, um, you know, hands-on projects such as building a small box out of two by fours, ranging up to how to build a wall and install electrical circuitry in it. Um, and those kind of baseline or transferable skills help set the, um, you know, kind of give you some background information as someone with no info on in the field for this solar PV installation part of the course. Um, in addition, they receive certifications in OSHA 30 and our local site safety training, which is required for anyone on an um, active job site in New York City. Uh, in addition to that, during the training and the uh, construction period itself, uh, like I said, they were paid during the training and then folks were paid um, between 18 and $20 on average for the construction period. Um, so a little bit more about the training itself. Uh, we have a pretty set two week course that is solar one material. It's derived from a lot of concepts that are familiar for those who have taken a NABSEP training, but a, a little more simplified for people that haven't had any experience in the field and this is completely new to them. Um, so they're going to participate in these hands on courses to really get, you know, demonstrated experience for what they'll be doing on the roof. Um, so, you know, system design that is a simple concept training in both uh, roof mounted and ballast mounted ballast mounted systems, which are very prevalent on the flat roofs in New York City. Um, and, you know, basic O&M and commissioning as well. So those who completed the program, they received Solar One certificates of completion, as well as the safety certifications I mentioned. 
So now just some photos of the installation itself, which are really cool to see. So these are all students who went through the training program, um, doing the actual, you know, exciting part here, seeing the panels putting put on the ballast. Another really cool shot. Um, Accord Power is the installer who was um, one of our partners on this project. Um, we've done a lot of work with them across New York City, and I'd be remiss not to shout them out because they have a really, um, uh, it's a core value of theirs as well to make sure that we are trending in a more equitable direction in the solar industry. Um, I want to be cognizant of time. So thank you so much again uh, for listening. And Max, I'm Max Levitsky at Solar One, and I will pass it on to, I think Juan was next. That's correct. Juan, Juan Para with Nexam, which is you know, a much larger organization, but similar successful Sunny Award winner in 2022. So Juan's going to share Nexamp's special sauce. Thank you, Max, for sharing Solar One. And of course, everybody on the call, we will get back to each of our panelists with a robust Q&A at the end of each panel, all the panelists' presentations. So hang on, keep your questions coming in the chat. Thanks. Juan, please take it away. Always happens. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Juan. I'm the uh, Director of Community Engagement here at Nextamp, also a proud Solar One alumni. So Great to see my former coworker Max on this panel. <laughs> um, and today I'm gonna talk a bit more about um, a few of the projects that were recognized with this, uh, but more so about some lessons learned and how that's expanding to additional equitable workforce programs here at Nexamp. Um, so just a little bit about Nexamp. Um, we are um, one of the largest, if not the largest community solar provider in the country. Um, we own and operate our own projects. Um, so that gives us a benefit of of knowing exactly um, you know, where things are on the development side and also providing great experience on the customer side. Um, and so it just really allows us to provide a great end-to-end -end experience for our partners, our contractors, and our customers. Um, and we really value community uh, and equity. And you know, we wanna make sure that we're good partners to the communities in which we're served, which we serve. Um, where we're installing our projects. Um, and it's it's definitely a, a mandate that we have um, coming from the very top. Um, and so all around the company, I think people are very passionate just about um, being good stewards to the community. And so hoping to highlight one of the ways that we've been able to do that. Um, just a bit more, um, we have um, over a gigawatt of operational and pipeline projects. Um, we have, we're based out of Boston, um, but we basically have projects in every state where community solar um, has been implemented. Um, we have different types of solar and storage projects, but community solar is our bread and butter. Um, and of course, we participate in a lot of the, the um, trade associations and working groups within each state, um, just to make sure that we're sharing knowledge as we go along. Um, and we have uh, a lot of customers, um, a lot of projects, uh, a lot of experience. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this um, because, um, yes, it's cool, you know, it, and we're proud of our work. But, um, you know, I think it also um, we want to make sure that we are taking advantage of our scale to make a difference as well. So, um, you know, I think it's very um, important to us to make sure that um, as a leader in this space in terms of like the size of projects and the number of customers um, that we're also leading on the um, uh, around like workforce development and, and equitable workforce as well. Um, so a bit more about the projects that were recognized. Um, we had uh, three community solar projects in Illinois um, split between the Ameren and Com Medicine territory that were built between 2021 and 2022 um, that had to comply uh, under the Qualified Job Trainee Program of the Illinois Solar for All Program. Uh, so this was a program that required that a certain percentage of hours um, of the hours that were being worked by, um, uh, by employees on the job sites um, followed Qualified Job Trainee um, uh, requirements. And so um, altogether, there were uh, 14 trainees um, 
that were involved in this program. And there were at least 5,000 hours logged. I'll explain that at least in a little bit. Um, and the story behind these projects is that they were actually acquired by uh, SunPower and Trajectory, which did the initial um, development work here. Um, and then we recruited um, electrical subcontractors um, to uh, do the electrical work and also do the recruitment of the workforce trainees um, and to help meet the requirements of the um, the job trainee program requirements. Um, so um, this was a program, this is a project that um, uh, kind of predated me. Um, so, you know, I could definitely speak a little bit more about how it was in terms of recruitment based on what I've picked up from people that were at the company at that time. But I, I really wanted to focus on kind of like the lessons learned after the experience and um, how we are kind of um, expanding some of our equitable workforce programs based on um, kind of this initial go. And um, one of our first takeaways was that um, the roles around um, who owns certain aspects of the um, workforce program, I think needed to be clear up front. Um, things like the recruitment of the participants and the logistics behind some of the trainings. Um, those are things that I think were, uh, could have been a little bit smoother. Um, it was uh, a few people's first time doing this type of work. And I think that's something that we we learned, especially when we're working with subcontractors, which I know is pretty common in this industry, um, is to just um, have that information up front um, and as to who's gonna be managing uh, kind of the the program uh, logistical program areas um, and the relationship with this uh, with the um, trainees um, and then the other side of this is documentation and compliance um, and so you have to log the hours and what type of work each trainee was doing whether it was construction or maintenance or other types of categories um, you have to get signatures from the trainees, making sure that, you know, it's, it's um, accurate. And um, this was a lot of this documentation for this project was an after the fact. And unfortunately, we just couldn't verify some hours. So that's why I said at least 5,000, because we know there are more. Um, but because of the way that um, some of this information was collected after the fact, we unfortunately just couldn't verify it. Um, and so I think that's something that we've taken as another lessons learned is, you know, there's an actual program design and the um, the logistics of the recruitment and the relationships with the trainees and the follow through and all that. Um, and then there's an actual compliance part of it and documentation, which is a whole different animal. Um, and then unfortunately, we couldn't also analyze the long-term results because of a function of the, the last two. Um, and so along with the ownership, um, I currently couldn't find um, that we had contact with a lot of the trainees. And so I know anecdotally that some of them are still working in the field, um, but I couldn't find that um, concrete information. Um, but one big takeaway too is that we still want to do this. You know, you know, I don't want to. I wanted to focus this on lessons learned, but we wanted to take those lessons learned and apply them to future programs because um, we, as I said, we want to continue to be a leader in the space, not just in the number of projects that we're we're installing, but um, in the number of equitable workforce programs that we're launching and the number of jobs that we're bringing to the communities that we serve. Um, so in the next slide, um, this is kind of the result of some of the lessons learned that are starting to be applied. Um, so we, we are, um, seriously expanding a lot of our equitable workforce programs. Um, there is, um, requirements in some states like Illinois, there's el eligible equity contractor requirements, there are IRA requirements coming up. Uh, like apprenticeship requirements. Um, and we are building our own program outside of those requirements. Um, one of the examples is the Clean Energy Catalyst program. Um, it's a three-week training program where 
uh, individuals that are underemployed or unemployed um, with no prior experience in solar can be trained up to do more of the construction supervisor roles. Um, so not necessarily um, construction like um, installation roles, but more of the administrative um, and again, like reporting aspects of the job. Um, so it's something that we've um, we've done in a couple of states and we really want to continue to seriously expand. And we really want um, basically in every, every project that we have in the future, we want to have individuals that completed our clean energy catalyst program. Um, and another um, program that we are um, piloting as well, kind of separate from the construction side, um, is the community liaison. I, I didn't include it in the slide, but I'll talk about it. Um, but this is more on like the community outreach and um, uh, customer acquisition side of community solar. Um, and so it's training up folks from local communities uh, to basically do uh, events, outreach, different um, local outreach that um, would then uh, allow local and individuals from the local workforce to gain more experience in solar um, and skills that are different than construction, um, which is typically what people think about when they think about workforce and solar. So really trying to kind of like diversify the skill sets that um, would that that we're trying to uh, kind of build pathways into solar energy. Um, and then we're working internally to just make sure that we can continue to build upon these programs in the best way. Um, so we have like a, 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 I'm on the community engagement team um, and we're responsible for a lot of like our community partnerships um, and then working uh, more closely with our uh, clean energy deployment team, which does like the EPC, like the construction work um, and making sure that we are just checking in a lot more often, not working in silos and seeing where we could build synergies together. Um, and then we recently um, posted a VP of workforce role um, just because we know that this is going to be a huge, um, a huge um, focus for our company going forward. And there is just so much work that needs to be done and so much more alignment. Um, and it made sense for us to build a new uh, leadership position uh, to own a lot of this work. And I think we have you know, we're a larger company and I acknowledge that that's not something that everyone can can do. I think we we have the benefit of that scale. But I think the takeaway here is that um, that internal alignment to make sure that different teams that are touching different types of outreach, engagement, uh, workforce are coming together, um, thinking about the scope of what these projects look like from program design to recruitment to supporting the trainees during and after, um, helping to find long-term jobs. And then the compliance piece is all being thought about. Um, so overall, I think it was a good experience to really um, provide us with insights into how to make these programs more successful in the future. And I'll pass it to Kevin. Thanks, Juan. Yeah, I wanted to bring out Kevin before you get started. I wanted sure. to emphasize one point that that Juan shared with the group, and that is the unique the need not to just have your own little thing going as your own company organization, but to think about if you're able um, to have a community liaison hopefully somebody from the community um, who can be the whisperer between the solar wind and so forth developers, EPCs and the community and its needs. It can be from the company, but it better from the community who uh, a person who can work with the company, with the organization to build trust, to build um, acceptance of the project and to build interest in becoming uh, a professional within to build a career within a clean energy uh, entity. Okay, enough said by me. Kevin, please take it away and thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Um, just a quick thank you to the National Community Solar Partnership and the Department of Energy for, for hosting these important educational events. And one of the things we found out with our training 
um, is everything begins with a conversation. We can't know what we don't know. Um, we are a commercial solar developer. We're based in Asbury Park, New Jersey. We're a national developer. We do more community solar work uh, in New Jersey uh, than we do in any other state at this point, or they're doing quite a bit in uh, other states. But that's really where our workforce uh, started. And I kind of want to take everybody through this. I look at this picture. I can't help but my old development hat, you know, years ago, we would just have that first section of panels where the only panels we could put on that great big logistics center because we could only put enough panels on there to power the building. And we drop that little teardrop, that little waterfall down and we tap in and we we power that logistics center, which doesn't use a lot of electricity and we're losing that entire rooftop. And the wonderful thing about community solar is now we get to put panels on the entire rooftop and instead of powering just the building, we're powering the community and all the benefits that that bring uh, brings rather is incredible. So I wanna kind of just touch that and start there and then talk about workforce. Um, this is the project that we we won for. It's, it's one Catherine in Teterboro, New Jersey. Um, it's part of the first year of the pilot program of the New Jersey Community Solar uh, Program, which started in 2019. This is actually part of an array of projects that we did for Duke Realty. Ultimately, they were purchased by uh, Prologis, um, but they're still up there operational. They're subscribed. We're real excited about it. And the folks who helped us um, engage the community-based organizations were, were, were rewarded because the trainees that they helped us uh, connect with um, helped build these projects. So this particular location is 1.9 megawatts uh, in size, and it's powering about 275 homes and apartments in Bergen County. Um, the entire array is about 11 megawatts. That gave us a real opportunity in the first year of, of community solar to do exactly what the state asked us to do which is to get involved in workforce. Now we are a, we started out in 2012 uh, as a construction company. So pragmatically we had to figure out well, how are we gonna build a workforce development program? Like, like Juan, we build, we own, we operate. Um, and in New Jersey, we're building every one of our projects as, as well as other states. We're still using a lot of our workforce rather than subcontracting. Ultimately we'll start subcontracting contracting more and more, but most of the building that's done is done by us. So that's really what we knew. So as we were starting to determine um, what our workforce development would look like, kind of that's where we started. So I kind of want to take you through what that looks like and how we arrived where we are and what we're looking to do in the future. did want to point out that this project, along with the other three, was actually voted the Community Solar Project of the Year in 2021. A lot of that had to do uh, with our workforce development, which actually was featured in, in uh, uh, Solar Power World magazine. Um, we were real excited about that. It, it started out pragmatically as something that we were going to do, and now it's become part of the brand of who we are. And I think, Chris, some of the things that you said just connected with every conversation we had with every community-based organization that we worked with, every training organization. So I kind of want to take you through how we got to where we are. We did hire five people from within the community to help build this project. Ultimately, that number grew to 19 and now 29 through the work that we're doing just in New Jersey. Um, let me show you, it, it's kind of strange as I looked at Max and Juan and and thought I'm by far the oldest panelist on here. If you combine them, they wouldn't be my age, right? But with my age comes a little bit of cynicism. So when we heard about all the benefits that community solar was going to bring, I was cynical. I didn't know that it was actually going to happen, but these promises are being fulfilled and I'm watching it happen. And now that we have 10 years of this wind at our backs, from, from the IRA, from a $600 billion investment in solar, from a commitment of 200, 300, 400,000, who knows, solar energy jobs, boy, we really have an opportunity to, to do something special. And I think that's what our focus here is at Solar Landscape. So um, when we started, it was just us. We got a group of people together. I, I was put in charge of this and I hired some teachers um, to help us with curriculum and uh, an adjunct professor who, who came on board and helped us with the training. And But it was kind of just us and we really, didn't know exactly how we were going to roll this out. We were fortunate in that we happened upon Edison Job Corps, which is part of National Job Corps, which I believe was um, developed during the, the Johnson or the Kennedy and Johnson administration right in that 1963, 1964. So there's Job Corps all over the country. And what they do is 
they work with students who are 16 to 24 who maybe didn't have the straightest straightest path in their lives. And they house the students right on the campus there. They pay them a stipend, small stipend, but they get three square meals a day and they get training. Part of the training that they're doing in Edison Job Corps is construction training. So we, as we began our process of, of building a workforce development program as part of Solar Landscape, we were fortunate that we met with Edison Job Corps. We're real excited about going in and kind of augmenting some of the training that their construction folks were getting um, right there in Edison, Central New Jersey. And then, you know, what do we say? We make plans and then God smiles or something. Well, COVID hit. So suddenly Edison Job Corps was completely closed. Schools were closed. Community-based organizations were closed. And we had a commitment to the state of New Jersey that we were going to train 125 people as part of the approved community solar projects we got in the first year of the program, which was more than 20 megawatts. So how did we do that? Well, we did our, our solar install training virtually. It was part NAPSEP, part solar install training. It was not the best way to do it. It was difficult to do. We pushed through. We did have some success stories through that. We hired three people from Edison Job Corps early on. One young man, Ricky Gass, is still with us. Uh, when we built the first community solar project ever in the state of New Jersey and, and Governor Murphy came and cut the ribbon, we were fortunate that Ricky Gass uh, actually introduced the governor that day. And that was a proud moment for us and our workforce development team. Subsequent to that, Ricky's had two children. He's about to have his third. And we just hired his brother, Lucius, as part of our team. And Lucius just had a little baby as well. Um, Chris said something earlier about prevailing wage. I think about that a lot because, again, we're a construction company. When you go to, here, here's a key to this. When you can go to an organization like Edison Job Corps or some of these other training organizations and let them know that in most states, these solar jobs on these big community solar projects are going to pay prevailing wage in New Jersey, that's 62 or $63 an hour. That's a family sustainable wage. That's what we call that. You will immediately get their attention and, ha and have them saying, tell me more. And ultimately, that's what we want to do, right? So when we were at Edison Job Corps, we encountered uh, GAF. Now, those of us who are in, this, in the industry know that GAF is the largest roofing manufacturer really in the world. They also have a training arm called the GAF Roofing Academy. They were trying to get a foothold in to do training in Edison Job Corps. We realized that there's some synergy between roofing and solar. So we decided to combine our efforts and they're doing the roofing training and we're doing the solar training. So at Edison Job Corps, that's a 10 day training that comes with OSHA 10 certification that comes when you graduate with uh, attachment to GF's work belt, which, which gives you access to every uh, roofing contractor who's, who's um, doing this business across the country. And it gives them notification that you've graduated from the program. That's the 10 day program. We also have an abbreviated five day program that we're doing out in different underserved communities. We've been in Camden, we've been in Trenton, we've been in Asbury Park, we've been in Perth Amboy, and we've been in other communities bringing this training to people who don't, don't necessarily go to Edison Job Corps. That's kind of a closed off organization. So we're, we've taken this on the road. So we actually have a 10 day training, a five day training, and then an abbreviated two day training, which is um, solar only. What we found in these conversations that we were having is the problem um, in a lot of these communities that we're working in is not just getting the people trained. That's part of it. There's two other, there's two other issues, connecting them to employment, and helping them with transportation. There's a third that we haven't tackled yet, Chris, I promise you we're working on it. And that is childcare, okay? So we have people who get through the training and now what's my next step to, to get connected with jobs? So what we've done is we've aligned ourselves with other solar companies, particularly residential solar companies. We've incorporated residential solar training into our curriculum. And now, for example, Trinity Solar, which is a national uh, a residential solar company and one of our great partners went to our tr training that we had at Brookdale Community College a couple of weeks ago and hired three of the people right on the spot who went through that training, which is wonderful. The only thing worse we found from um, not doing any training at all is doing this training and giving 
folks a false hope of employment. That can't be more self-defeating. So that's one of the things we focused on. We hired an award-winning uh, recruiter um, from Robert Half, and she heads up our placement. So we literally have a placement arm at Solar Landscape now. The final thing was transportation. And Kate Gold, who um, heads up our placement, she made a connection, a connection with Lyft, the rideshare company. And Lyft has a program called Lift Up. She shared with them the work that we're doing. And what Lift Up did is gave us a $7,500 grant to use with our Edison Job Corps students to help them get back and forth to job interviews and get back and forth to their job trainings for the first two to three weeks until such time as they get their first check and can start to pay for some of this. This is the young lady who got the first ride, which I believe was about a week and a half ago. We were rolling it out July 1st, but she was ready to go. So we made an exception and, and that is her on her way to her job, um, which is about an hour away. So this kind of help is what we're finding that folks need. And then the final piece is, is, is child care for, for a lot of the, um, the folks we're working with. And we'll ultimately, we'll, we'll continue to work and see if we can solve some of those problems at all. So just a, a couple of success stories here. You know, we talked about Ricky and Lucius, and we had a, a partner called Interfaith Neighbors, um, struggled with doing training there because of COVID. And then we, we emerged from COVID and we said, who's, who's your person? Who's your person here? Who's special? Who's your person here? We can get up and trained and employed. We trained him individually. He's a young man named Nico Horner. Didn't necessarily have the straightest path in his life. Nico's an amazing employee and we just hired Nico's brother. We are a family owned organization. We're privately owned and, and we're about family. And so Nico's now working with us, his brother, Ricky and his brother. And then the final piece, to our program was when we did our remote training, we had a young young woman named Yvette Viasus who worked with us. She went through the training, even though she had no intention of becoming a solar installer, she just wanted to learn. We were impressed with her. We brought her on board. Ultimately, she became the director of community engagement for our company. We hired her identical twin sister who works in the community engagement team. And I'm very proud to announce, shockingly, that I would be proud to announce this, that Yvette left us on the 30th of June to take a job, a fellowship with the Department of Energy to go out to New Mexico to help the state of New Mexico connect folks who are doing LIHEAP, which is energy assistance, federal energy assistance to community solar programs. It's been a big struggle to be able to do that. So Yvette from our team who went through our training is that helping the Department of Energy solve that problem? And I'll tell you in terms of being proud, I don't get all weepy, but I couldn't be more proud of that young lady. She's a force and she will continue to be a force in this industry. Here's just a couple of, of pictures. That the, the other thing that we've done in the center with the, with the Catherine Project, we went to, at Bergen County, New Jersey, which is North Jersey, went to Bergen County Technical School and we did a train the trainer. We recognize that when we're doing this training, if you look at the picture on the left, we're training about 10 or 12 um, um, people at a time. It's, it, it, you can't be effective if the classes are any bigger than that. So we decided we needed some disciples and the best place to get that were some of the technical teachers. Back when I was in school, we called it vocational school. Now it's technical schools. Go to these technical schools that are uh, um, teaching trades and let's see if we can um, help these folks uh, do solar installation training. So as part of the training that they go through, they get a certification from us. They get uh, uh, videos from us that help with the training. And then they, we, we give each of the schools that, that ask for it, the four solar panels and all the racking and the guns that they need to do this training. So it's pretty much um, plug and play that they can continue this program. So again, we're, we're learning as we go. Um, we're going to continue to get better. The final piece I'll say in all this is that uh, this was recognized by um, Solar Power World and Kate Cole from our team was called the Solar Change Maker of the Year. You'll appreciate this, Chris, because it, it, as we, we talk about this, it says actively bringing it to underserved communities, and they're talking about diversity and inclusion in the solar industry. All of our goals from from the jump on what we're doing with Community Solar, we're completely aligned with the slides that you shared earlier. <clears throat> we just got a $550,000 grant from the state of New Jersey to continue our training. It's called a bridge grant. Um, that's specific to New Jersey, but because we've taken our training on the road, we've gone to Maryland and Chicago and, 
and uh, New Mexico and other places as well. We just got it, an additional $850,000 grant we're proud to announce um, from the federal government to continue the training that we're doing. So we're, we're beyond proud. We're going to continue to grow and, and, and solar training and connecting people with green energy jobs is going to continue to be our brand. One of the things our CEO said a long time ago is how would people in underserved communities be aware that these opportunities in the green energy economy even exist if we don't take our responsibility to make them aware of it? And that's what we do every day. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, Ali. And thanks for, the, for Harrison and for your team over there for, for allowing us to share our story. Wonderful. Thank you so much, each of the panelists. That was incredibly inspiring. So we're going to go ahead and move to the discussion portion, along with some audience Q&A. Um, we do not have all the time in the world. We have around 12, 13 minutes. So I'll turn it back over to our moderator, Chris. Thank you, Allie. And, you know, I can't say enough about all the panelists. Uh, Kevin, you were the most recent, and I'm, I'm very familiar with Solar Landscape, very proud of what you've been able to do. NextAmp and uh, Solar One, you're all leaders. I want to point out to the, the group here that you're sort of in different locations. You work in, you know, your headquarters, New Jersey, Boston, New York. Um, also, but your assets are more spread out and you've utilized different avenues and pathways to bring in um, the community into training and into jobs within your own organization and in parallel organizations. I wanna throw some questions out. Of course, this whole webinar is about how, how did you do this? And mostly you've spoken to, you know, broad brush uh, the practices you engage in. So let's get it, let's get nitty gritty. Like, specifically. Um, I want to I want to focus Kevin on Job Corps as a particular uh, population. Um, I, I when I was with the Department of Labor long ago, I helped write the green jobs requirements for Job Corps. This is like 20 years ago now. Uh, very interested in them. Job Corps is a specific group of population, as you say, 16 to 24, mostly non high school graduates, so they can get GDs and various types of training. And often the Job Corps emphasizes craft construction, which is it, for those who do workforce understand that craft construction is a generic model for the construction trades, OSHA requirements, and then different kinds of uh, construction skills that prepare the candidate or the young person for the more specific avenue they're going down. How did Solar Landscape then bring your, your workforce candidate, your workforce participants into a solar vein or a solar specific certification? It, it, it was, um, we were fortunate, we were fortunate, it, Chris, we, I, I showed up at Edison Job Corps with Kate Gold to interview one of their students who I'd been impressed with in an event I went not even realizing I can't get on campus because there's a lot of security there. As I'm driving yeah. away, their director called me and said, you guys are green energy. We need green energy. Let's set an appointment and come back. And so that was fate. And it couldn't have been um, couldn't have been better because they got behind it immediately. And Tony Stainings pushed it and got us into Woodland Job Corps and got us into Albuquerque Job Corps. And they were they were all about it. They recognized that it was uh, that's where the jobs are going to be. Tony did and got Job Corps National behind it as well. So we have support kind of across the board now with everything we're doing. Cool. I want to ask all the panelists. Now, each of you during your presentations mentioned we, whether it was Solar One or Nexamp or uh, Solar Landscape, we have perhaps preparatory training and you call it your particular program. And it may or may not dovetail right into a NABCEP certification or a nationally recognized certification. So are your specific preparatory or, or trainings recognized and certified? And if they're certified, who certifies? Is there an ANSI or, or similar uh, international standards body certifying your training programs, or do you use an already certified program? I'll go first. Um, so Solar One's material is a combination of curriculum we developed in-house, and then it 
often almost always does that dovetail into some sort of industry certification, whatever sector we may be focused on. So our materials are one that our own curriculum is governed under the New York State Department of Labor. Um, but it does honestly, we're allowed a lot of flexibility because we, every program, whether it's solar or maybe another sector, um, those are customized to almost every client, which is often another um, nonprofit CBO in the New York City area to really fit their needs. So sometimes that's a one week crash course in green building o &M. Other times it could be an eight week program that covers uh, green construction, HVAC, solar, and five different certification exams within. So it's very fluid um, and we really try to meet people where they're at. And by people, I mean specifically the students yeah. and most importantly, whatever jobs may be available after the program is completed. I really like okay. what Kevin said about training people, not with, it, not with just the intention of putting them through a program, but with the, you know, bordering on the necessity of doing what, whatever can be done to get them placed in a job, because that's what this is all about. Yeah, absolutely. Juan. Yeah, it, it depends. Um, for the projects that were recognized with this award under the ELSA program, there were specific, um, uh, uh, like, uh, eligible projects um that would meet the like the requirements um and so so or not projects i'm sorry um more like trainees uh so some of those were like pre-vetted by the program um with the own our own construction catalyst program that we're doing um that's the one that's like training more on the construction supervisor role um there is osha training um but other than that um we're developing that curriculum on our own and um we are providing like our own certification. Um, so it's like, you know, something more tangible that um, if there is an opportunity to work for another provider and then that they still have like some type of uh, completion certification um, that's a bit more tangible. Um, and then we are looking into um, more construction focused workforce programs, um, yeah. like the ones like Solar One does or like Solar Landscape has done. Um, and we would probably rely on um, uh, organizations that have done, established their own um, curriculum and training and certifications rather than like starting from scratch for those. Yeah, and that speaks to, and I think all of you are very good at this, the, the looking for and actively forming partnerships and collaborations to either meet your own training needs or get the folks in the training uh, jobs at the end of the train, cannot stress, Kevin, right on, cannot stress this enough. Training is the easy part. Training and hiring is the goal. The outcome is not train. The outcome is career. Career with a mobile certified credential that you can take anywhere and it's recognized, which is why I asked the question about, are your programs certified? If you are a worker and you go through, you know, solar training ABC and you pass and, and then you go move to a different state and you're like, hey, I have solar training ABC, here you go. And they're like, what the heck is that? You gotta have something that's certified that people recognize. I wanna speak, we don't have that much time. I wanna speak to something that Max mentioned in, in conversation and that is what kinds of project activities do you think are really important in order to expand these overall opportunities for inclusive workforce training um, that include equity, that specify equity? What kind of systemic or larger forces need to come into play to let us all scale up and expand equitably? Yeah, um, it is really, we need to see the replication of the model that um, govern the program that I described. And what I mean by that is in order for any developer to even apply to be considered for being given these projects on the NYCHA uh, residences, they had to have a workforce development component and, you know, specific plan in place, not just a training, but training placement, coordinating with installers who were going to be on board with interviewing and hiring people from a workforce development program. And I don't see any reason why that can't be expanded, you know, across the whole country in any sort of similar solicitation. Um, I know the state of New Jersey has a very strong initiative for the 
community solar work with the NJDPU. And Solar One is very excited to become more involved in that in the next couple of years as well. Um, but it's, it's a way to sort of bring these two worlds even closer together and make sure that the hiring opportunities are also being given to the local community and not just developments where, you know, the one company is able to profit off of something that is very large, but instead really making it more inclusive as a whole. I just want to add one quick thing, Max. Um, the, the, because of the IRA, developers have the opportunity to make even more money on these projects. So developers have the wherewithal to get this training done, even if it's, and it's, and it's been up to this point, all at our own expense. And we have the jobs. Or, or, and or we can connect with the jobs. So to Max's point, in order to make this happen, um, these programs have got to encourage that. New Jersey did have a robust program for the permanent program. The straw proposal said that workforce development, as far as everything that we read, is not, not going to be something that would score points. So my concern is it's part of our brand. We'll continue to do it, Chris. But my concern is some other developers might pull away from it in New Jersey. And I think then we lose uh, the community and community solar. I think it's something that other states have emulated and it's made our, our program so beautiful in our home state. We cannot get away from that. Yeah, I think uh, Max, Kevin, and I know Juan, you share this too. If if you just go in and build a project and there's nothing connecting your project to the people and neighbors and community where that project is located, that's a pretty vacuous proposal. I mean, it's, it's the electrons disassociated from the social and community fabric and economic development needed to sustain a green economy and the individual families living there. It's just like, hey, devoid of moral value. So that's a pretty bold statement. I shouldn't, I should probably take that back. But I mean, seriously, it's like if you're just training and you're just out there like doing your thing and making money on the backs of people who've already had people make money off of them. This is where we're at a change point now. And thank you, National Community Solar Partnership, Department of Energy, Department of Labor, um, this administration for emphasizing the need for equity, for a new type of systemic change to bring the voice and the capacity of our communities into a position of wealth sharing, wealth building, career and professional opportunity. It's all about equity. We always get back to equity. Do we have fair and just opportunity? Um, and if we don't, how do we help deliver that? So uh, these panelists, I know we're about out of time. These panelists have great ideas. Everyone on this webinar will get the slides. They'll be up through the National Community Solar Partnership site. Allie's going to take care of making sure this resource is available to everyone. We want to make sure you're aware and don't forget to sign up for the rest of the webinars. Apply for the Sunny Awards in 2023. If you have not already, you've got a great project. And contact these panelists and their organizations for great ideas on how to replicate and build powerful and equitable workforce programs that bring all of our neighbors into this opportunity. Allie, thank you and take us out. Oh, I feel like so inspired right now. It's going to carry me through the rest of the week. I'm so excited. So as Chris said, yes, we have um, two more webinars in our series. So please, folks, join if you can. Um, you will be able to see these slides after the fact. We will send them out to everybody. And then, yes, again, the, the deadline is July 14th to apply to this new round of the Sunny Awards for Equitable Community Solar. Thank you again, Chris, Kevin, Juan, Max. You all did a wonderful job. And thank you to everyone joining in our virtual room. We really appreciate it. And stay connected to the NCSP. More to come. Thank you all.